Welcome back to the series Uncensored Conversations, promoting open and critical dialogue about COVID-19 and its consequences. My name is Romina Strati, and I'm currently based at SOAS, University of London. I'm also co-founder uh, of Decolonial Subversions, together with my colleague Monica Hirmer, um, which is a platform uh, that aims to be open access, multilingual, uh, and uh, to bridge uh, scientific knowledge production with societal issues and, and public concerns. Uh, this YouTube channel, in fact, in the current series uh, uh, that we're going to be um, discussing today, is part of our commitment to, to bridge those two realms together. So the outbreak of COVID-19 has combined with uh, what we've observed as uh, extensive polarization, uh, maybe a deterioration of healthy dialogue, uh, perhaps also um, uh, you know, uh, monolithic or partisan reportage on media, uh, you know, that are informed by certain narratives, uh, problematic convergences of public, uh, of political, uh, epistemic and capitalist interests, the encroachment of uh, high tech uh, companies in public health data collection, which raises all sorts of issues around privacy, uh, but also uh, an amplification uh, or visibility, a, a higher visibility of socioeconomic inequalities and their implications uh, for this pandemic. So we set up this series essentially to start uh, asking these questions more systematically that we don't think are being addressed uh, in, in the medical and epidemiological discussions. Um, you know, the more fundamental social, philosophical and ethical questions that that, uh, you know, this might, we might, we might take a step back and, and use this pandemic as an opportunity to ask ourselves. And we hope to do this by inviting, uh, you know, specialized thinkers uh, with diff from different backgrounds and specializations to have an open, uncensored, frank conversations around these issues. Um, so we're glad to continue today this series with a discussion around government responses and the involvement of the public, especially in democratic governments, but not limited to those. And, and, and the role, uh, how the public has been engaged so far. Uh, there are different, evidently different regimes, different governments in the world, and you know, different governments have responded quite differently. And in fact, some of the most successful cases have been in what we call the global south, in low and middle income countries, and actually not by democratic regimes necessarily, which is interesting. Uh, on the other hand, in contexts such as the UK, where it is a democracy, we have, uh, you know, there has been quite a critique about the response of the government so far from, from certain perspectives. Uh, we, we had, we've seen a response that could be described perhaps as erratic, uh, first uh, proposing a herd immunity approach, which was uh, quite widely criticized, then, uh, you know, the more drastic social uh, distancing measures being taken and, and the final drastic shutdown, uh, where, you know, only now uh, measures are being taken to lift that shutdown gradually. Um, since then, some have argued, in fact, that the response of the government, the total shutdown, was actually disproportionate to the public health crisis. Others have become more critical after seeing the disproportionate effects on different groups uh, of, the, of, uh, of the public, uh, the differential implications, socioeconomic, employment-wise, and so forth. Um, so obviously, you know, these, these responses raise important issues about how science and scientific communities have been engaged and what the role of the public has been in this engagement uh, by governments to respond to the public health crisis. Um, and maybe uh, what could have been or might be looking forward now that we're, we're lifting the lockdown, better processes or approaches to be more inclusive, to be more considerate of, of you know, the diversity of opinions and concerns within the public. So to do so, I have invited today Professor Graham Smith, who is Professor of Politics and Director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster, uh, Graham works on democratic theory and practice, in particular participatory democratic institutions or what is often called democratic innovations, and democracy in the long term. Uh, he is chair of the Charity Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development and is currently involved in a project led by the charity INVOLVE and the Center for the Study of Democracy. Uh, that seeks, in fact, to understand uh, how participation and deliberation with the public can improve decision making in response to COVID-19. So it's actually very much attuned to what we're doing today. We couldn't think of a better interlocutor for this conversation. Uh, Graham, it is a pleasure to have you today. Thank, uh, you. thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, I will not say more about your background because you've done so much. Uh, so I'll just invite you to give us a better sense of where you're coming from in this conversation or, you know, why this conversation is, is of interest to you. Okay, um, so I have a long term interest in questions of how um, everyday citizens can be involved in the political decisions that affect their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not that has been for the last 20, 30 years. 
uh, and as you said in your introduction, um, sort of the, demo the, the democratic or non-democratic response to uh, COVID-19 uh, br has brought into sort of sharp focus this question of the role of pol the political class, the role of experts, the role of everyday citizens and everyday everyday people. Um, and so, uh, and as you uh, as you've also suggested, COVID nineteen. Although we kind of have this rhetoric of we're all in it together, and um, you know it's the great leveler, it, it clearly isn't. Uh, and th there are so many different types of experiences that are happening. And those kind of inequalities that are emerging are the sort of, um, for me, are a sort of symptom of, of problems in the way that we do democracy now. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And it's actually it's a good se segue into the first question I had for you, because I was, you know, wanted to observe that, you know, most governments have resorted to scientific experts and not just scientific experts, but also epistemic communities, which is slightly different. So these technocratic organizations such as the WHO that set the standards and the paradigms within these fields. Um, and, and they have less en engaged less with the public. Um, and obviously that's problematic because science itself is politicized. It's not infallible. You know, it really depends on the models you use and the assumptions you make and so forth. Um, and, you know, I wonder, again, obviously the public has sort of given implicit consent to some liberties being taken away for the public good and welfare, but they weren't actively involved, to my knowledge, in, in that deliberation. So, you know, you have done extensive work on deliberation and participatory processes. Do you think that sort of citizen-oriented or public-oriented uh, approaches could be reconciled with the, uh, the emergency, such as the current one, where you just need to get the scientific advice in time? Uh, you know, is, could that cause a delay or is there a way to actually work with the public even in emergencies such as the current one? Well, I, I definitely go with your latter, your latter option. Um, <laughs> part of the problem though is, or part of the challenge is, if you haven't established, way, if you haven't got established ways of doing participation, of, of engaging um, <laughs> people in the process, to suddenly start establishing them at the moment of an emergency is, is a very difficult uh, um, a, a very difficult uh, context, if you like. So um, I think part of our problem here is we have a tradition of ways of doing government and ways of making decisions um, and faced with the kind of pandemic that we're, that we're faced with, that if you like, there's kind of a reentrenchment of our usual ways of doing things. And I think that, you know, sort of falling back on a, a small group of people making decisions, whether they be politicians and, and or experts, um, is, is the sort of traditional, I don't know, if you like, kind of war approach to, to, mm. do, to, 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 to respond to these kinds of uh, challenges. I think there's got, there are some real problems with that in, to do in, in terms of things like, you know, from a psychological perspective, things like groupthink, the, the, the way in which a, if a particular group of people with a very limited range of social backgrounds are making decisions those decisions won't reflect the diversity of the population who they are serving so i think there are there are various problems in terms of the tendency of the and I, you know i know the uk situation better than any of the british government almost closing ranks in terms of its decision making and, and two obvious ones and we can and we can um explore more radical perceptions conceptions here you know there was a real a very early on people were just making very simple observation that there didn't seem to be any women in the decision making process at all very good point uh, and, and then and then the second thing and again this is very british is it was all about central government local mm. government is kind of just seen as somebody who delivers some stuff for us but you know it turns out that all of the health officers who had been uh who are appointed in all these localities had no idea and had no way of inputting as far as i can tell so we kind of had this intense centralization within the UK and that is a tendency of our particular polity uh, mm. and is a real shame. And this is interesting I, I did read about uh, you know how, how the decision was trickled down essentially to the regions and the regional governments and I'm, I'm not familiar very well with the UK government and how it works but uh, but this actually raises the question of who do we include in the term public because you know it, it also it's not just uh, the people who are in government but also what do we mean by government right do we mean the central government do we mean the regional authorities and would, would there be a fine line between regional authorities and the public then? You said there's all these sort of yeah, conceptual yeah. questions, I, I guess. And I was wondering, since we're going to talk a lot about the public today, 
and I've, I've done a bit of reading on the genealogy of thought of how public has been conceptualized within public thought within the UK. And this has shifted okay, according to, to how the government has, <laughs> yeah, well, according to how the government has, so it's the government's priorities in terms of the population mm -hmm. uh, and, and how the, the public would respond each time and then they would shift their thinking. Uh, from what I understand, again, not an expert in this area, but I, I thought it would be important for us to define the public in our conversation. So yeah, yeah. when you use it, for instance, what is your definition in a what do you point to? Yeah, there's there's two terms here actually, and you probably want to get to public and citizen, and they're both yes. they're both they're both actually really deeply problematic. There's a kind of um, I don't know want to use there's a there's a kind of um, use of there's a use of these terms without too much thought, and I think mm. actually unpacking them is really important. So when people, I mean, there is a kind of very formal definition of the public being the population that lives within the boundary of that particular state and you know that that isn't entirely helpful mm. um and again with citizen there's a kind of formal definition of what is a citizen having legal status etc mm. but in terms of um public participation very often the term citizen will be used but actually when you look at most forms of public participation it will be residents or it'll be people who happen to be in a geographical area or people who happen to be organizing around a particular issue mm. their actual their actual legal status is is not is not is not a matter of concern there obviously it is with things like elections mm. we can come back to that in a minute so when i'm thinking about when the term public participation is being used that will typically try to refer to engaging ordinary ordinary everyday people as distinct from professional politicians, public officials, um, ex, um, technical experts, or organized interests. So it's a kind of, if you like, one way of understanding it is a sort of contradistinction to those other categories. Yeah. But, when um, we, but, but actually public participation is problem, problematic because it assumes a single public. And actually, um, I think it's much better to think about publics. Um, yes. Um, Good point. You know, publics organ around, organize around particular issues and particular uh, geographical locations. They are not coterminous to particular political boundaries. Publics can stretch across what happen to be our, our territorial boundaries. So actually the two concepts that we use a lot, public participation, that's problematic because it's actually about publics. Every, every time mm -hmm. you organize a form of public participation, you are constructing who the public is. You're deciding who gets to participate and when you um and the term citizen is problematic i mean i we can talk about this later maybe but i, I work a lot on these things called citizens assemblies mm. well actually they're not they're usually residence assemblies but actually that <laughs> you know it, but but citizen has this kind of cachet within contemporary yeah. politics and i think it's a term it's an empty term in many ways it's kind mm. of you know you've got to see how it's being used Precisely, um, and, and I, it's problematic. It's been problematic for me, particularly engaging with people, with who actually, interestingly, for your journal, people with a sort of yeah. decolonial perspective, saying actually this term is incredibly problematic, and I completely understand their argument. I just don't mm. know what to replace it with. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, kind of <laughs> it's true, and I think you know, especially if you apply decolonial lens to everything and, and language, but in general, uh, all the constructs in social sciences are simply that constructs, mm -hmm. and people need to. I think what we uh, away we can't avoid them, but we need to wor have clear working definitions. I think this is you know the best strategy so far that I've discovered. Uh, you know, in my own studies, a field of studies you know, that I work in gender and gender in itself is a highly uh, debated yeah. construct. So you know i think having a clear sort of understanding of what we mean and i and i think you're right i've in my questions to you actually uh, i I've, I've used public sometimes because i think it's a, it's plural uh, it's it's multiple uh, groups within the public and obviously it's not monolithic it's not uniform uh, people have diverse opinions and the question then becomes how do you engage that diversity and yes. you know it's 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 as you say it's like it's arbitrary every time you want to engage somebody uh, and then the question is okay how can you then engage you know, the, the more diverse uh, sample, I guess. So we will get to that, yeah. but, but um, because you, you mentioned elections, and I think that's, a, that's an important point that we could, should cover probably early mm -hmm. on in the discussion. Uh, you know, reading about this and in preparation of our discussion, uh, I've seen a lot of articles talking about a crisis of democracy. And obviously that goes back uh, much uh, before the pandemic here in the oh, UK, Brexit. Definitely. And, uh, you know, with, with uh, what is happening in the US with Donald Trump uh, not being, you know, so, Again, the, the rise of populism and, and, and uh, you know, all this 
uh, discussion about about a crisis of democracy and democratic institutions. Um, and you know, I was wondering um, why is it? I mean, I've, I I was raised in Greece, so I have a Greek pedia, which is uh, not just education, it's a bringing and way of thinking. Uh, and you know, we're, we're quite. I, I kind of I don't understand very much the. Uh, so I was uh, discussing with somebody uh, today, uh, yesterday, and they used the word sacred or holy. And then I, I applied that to democracy. And I think democracy in this, in the Western societies is often considered as the holiest thing that you can't criticize or condemn or, you know, uh, find problematic. And, you know, you know very well that it can be problematic because it depends on the processes, right? And, and the engagement of, of the stakeholders. Um, and, you know, I always think of Socrates uh, and, you know, he's at nefarious expectations about democracy because it often used to demagoguery, uh, it leads to demagoguery and then people I mean, his fear was that people would then respond on the basis of what appeals to them in terms of discourse and bias and stereotypes, which we all do because we are the product of stereotypes. We make decisions based on stereotypes. But, you know, as a, in response to that concern, for instance, um, why, you know, it seems to me that, that the, the, it's not about democracy as an idea, but it's really about the accountability aspect of it, the checks and balances. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, isn't, I mean, shouldn't we then place more emphasis on accountability? And I think this crisis really leads us to that point that it's not about making wrong decisions. All governments make wrong decisions. You know, we don't know, this was unpredictable, but then how can we change wrong decisions or bad decisions? I think this is the question and the question of accountability. Would you agree? And what would be your thoughts on this? Wow, okay. <laughs> it's a hard one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, you're, 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 pretty, you're, you're making me, you're making me respond to Plato. There we go. Um, <laughs> it's too so early in the morning. <laughs> it's, too early, it's too early in the morning. I mean, Plato is no lover of democracy. So, so that's, yes, a, yes, yeah. you, you brought out the, you brought out the big guns. <laughs> um, so I think accountability is clearly an issue which requires more consideration, but I, I want to go back one step mm -hmm. uh, and I want to suggest that um, well, first of all, I think one of the problems about um, the way that we define what is and what isn't a democracy is usually based about, about a, a formal set of institutions, whether these institutions exist or not, and whether mm. a certain set of uh, legal rights are in place, etc. And I think what that really misses is that democracy is actually, uh, you know, is as much a set of practices, it's as much a way of being, it's as much as a, a set of dispositions as, as it is a... Uh, just having a certain set of institutions so just having elections having a, le a legislature having freedom of expression etc does not for me they are formal characteristics of a political institution that may or may not re realize democratic aspirations so we so i so i want to make a distinction there and i think you're right that accountability is critical um but i want to say we should be spending more time thinking about how we make the decisions that we that we make. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, accountability is ab is absolutely important, in the, and holding governments to account in different ways is mm -hmm. a, is a weakness of of contemporary democracies. But one of the other weaknesses, which we which we kind of were were um, sort of recognising at, at the start of this conversation, is about the way that decisions are being made. I think we need to spend as much, and if not more, time thinking about how, why and how we make decisions in the way that we make them as much as, and then we would have a different set of questions about accountability if we did that first thing better. So I, so um, that's part of my interest in, in, in public participation or public's participation is, is that, uh, and participatory democracy and deliberative democracy is looking, is, 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 are there ways of us reimagining or reworking how we make political decisions and clearly part of that is questions of accountability but i but i don't, I don't want to just say this is making the people who are in positions of power now more accountable that's not enough that's not enough. yes yes you're right no absolutely and i think you're right you're saying you know we should be product we should be proactive instead of then having to deal with the consequences and the paraphernalia that comes you know with bad decisions and and that's true um and i i do think that you know in reconsidering or reimagine reimagining democracy which is a phrase that i've seen around uh we need to really think about which aspects are most problematic and you know what which aspects need to be rethought you know really taking a critical pragmatic empirical approach uh not being too defensive or which i have seen again but actually thinking okay how can we really 
uh, help governments make good decisions because these are, I mean, for the most part, they might have scientific backgrounds, but most are big bureaucrats and civil civil servants, uh, servants that might lack, you know, uh, they, they don't, they're not omniscient. Nobody is omniscient. Scientific committees are not omniscient either. So, you know, the more opinions, uh, informed opinions, I think the better, there is value to that. And this brings me to a very important question, uh, which, uh, you know, emerged when I was reading about citizen assemblies that you have written uh, on. Um, there is obviously an extensive uh, scholarship, as I understand, that debates the ability of the public or publics to make good decisions, right? Um, uh, but, you know, I think if you don't engage the public, again, you have uh, either an elitist or higher class uh, po a super political group or scientific group making decisions for the rest. But, you know, I know from, again, from a decolonial perspective that unless you have the experience of Poverty, for instance, you can't really understand how the poor person lives, for instance. You know, when, when you're not a, an irregular immigrant, you don't understand what an irre irregular immigrant goes th th through. So it's, there is value in having that conversation. So I wonder, what would you say to these critiques? I mean, how can you ensure that you, you can en engage the public uh, and, and get the best out of it? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to take, I'll, I'll take one step back about that and think about mm -hmm. the, crit the criticism that... Yes. That, that people, if you like, the, the people are too stupid argument. Because I think yes. that kind of so there's a kind of strand of democratic realism, which which goes all the way back. Well, it goes all the way back to Plato, actually. But, uh, you know, in terms of modern democracy, it goes back to people like Schumpeter, who basically mm. say we've got to defend the people from themselves. And we've got yes. to, we have, you know, giving people a choice between different political elite, elites is what democracy is. And after that, people shouldn't be involved because they engage in herd mentality and all those sorts of problems yeah. and the kind of things that Plato points at. And they would point to lots of evidence from surveys that people just are politically incompetent. They don't know who, yeah. who they don't know who their MPs are. They don't know how their political systems work. Yeah. Uh, the problem with the problem um, here is that a, a lot of this focuses on, or sorry, it fails to recognize that the, the institutional context within which people are engaging is absolutely critical. Mm. And what the work around deliberative um, processes has shown and the kind of work that you're talking to is you can design institutions within which people are uh, reasonable towards each other. They learn from each other. They learn from experts. They, um, they uh, are respectful. They can talk across diversity. They can come to collaborative judgments. Now, the easiest way of comparing that is to I don't know, Twitter or mm -hmm. something like that, which is also an institution, has been designed in a certain way and involves people shouting at each other and not listening. So I think when we think about what is it possible for people to do, we have to say, we have to recognise the institutional context, context within which they're engaging. So um, I've done, as you said, mentioned recently, I've done a lot of work recently around citizens' assemblies. And I really want to emphasise I do not think this is a silver bullet. This doesn't solve all of democracy's ills. It's just a very interesting way of um, doing um, public engagement mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and ensuring that you get informed voices and diverse voices. And, th and this is using forms of uh, random selection and using quota sampling to make sure that you have a group of citizens Sorry, use that word again, group of people. It's okay, no worries, we've defined it. We've, okay. we've, we've, discla yeah. we've provided the disclaimer. That okay, it's right at the front. Of course, someone might arrive in the conversation right here and, you know. True. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, we make sure that that, that, that um, group is as diverse as the broader population. So in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of age, in terms of social class. And what we discover is that if those when, when those spaces are really well facilitated, people um, step up to the mark. People are, they come into these processes with a lack of confidence, a lack of, a, 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 they don't believe that they can make the contribution that we know they can. And after a few days, these people are on top of the material. They're kind of uh, engaging with each other. I've done, I, it, was, it was an experiment. We did uh, Citizens Assembly on Brexit. And one of the things about Brexit is, is that like Twitter model, people just talk past each other. They didn't listen. Leave people talk to leave people, remain people talk to remain people, and never the twain shall meet. After the Brexit vote, we brought together um, 50 randomly selected citizens from all, from all over the UK, different, mm -hmm. uh, different mm -hmm. social backgrounds uh, and economic backgrounds. Um, and we had conversations with people across 
across leave, across remain. We made sure that we had 52% remain, 48%, sorry, 52% leave, 48% remain. And people were saying, this is the first time we've actually really had constructive conversations with people who have different views from ourselves. We, are, we don't invest enough in our civic infrastructure. We don't invest enough in creating spaces where people come to talk to people like themselves. And unfortunately, the digital world is making it worse because uh, you know, the algorithms that rule our lives mean that we only see the news that already fits with yeah. our way of seeing the world. We only get to be in Facebook. They suggest people who are like you, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> and, and, and Twitter reinforces tribes. So I'm, I'm not saying that all politics should be deliberative. All I'm saying is we can create those spaces within which people uh, of, of diverse people can come together and uh, and and come to collective judgments which is what po politics is about mm -hmm. lest we forget politics isn't just about shouting at each other politics is collectively coming to judgments and collectively making decisions i'll just one other thing because I, I think it's important i think there is a limitation of the citizens assemblies model and it's partly what you were referring to is i think some of the some of the more vulnerable groups in society, I think are unlikely to put themselves forward. So when an invitation, mm -hmm. so in a citizens assembly, what happens is you send thousands of invitations to households, inviting mm -hmm. them and, and from those, those people who then return and say, yes, I'd be interested in this process. You then ran, you then quote a sample from that group of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think at that point, more vulnerable groups, people mm -hmm. who are worried about their, um, about their status are not going to respond to a letter saying, come and participate people who have had poor experiences with authority may well not. And we've realized there's a lot more outreach necessary to get to those groups. There's also an issue in this, in that particular formulation of engagement that those groups remain a strong, remain a small minority yeah. within that broader diverse. So, so people have talked about oversampling particular groups to make sure that they have what feminists would refer to as a critical mass, that capacity mm -hmm. to, to, to sort of, feel the confidence and the ability to put their voices forward. But, but then there are other ways, you know, so we can put citizens assemblies to one side. There are other ways we can do engagement with vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th there are, it, you know, citizens, it's, it's not just Twitter or citizens assemblies. There's whole, there's, there's a, yeah. there are arrays of other mechanisms. And we've really got to be creative in exploring how we engage different groups. Sometimes you have to create mm -hmm what in academia we might call sort of subaltern publics, you know, sort of protected spaces for particularly- For safe spaces. Yeah, yes. exactly. For, for to, to build up their analysis and their way of doing, you know, their way of seeing mm -hmm. the world. Um, and then there are other times when you want to bring diversity together across, across difference. Yeah. So, you know, we've got to be creative. And, and I re 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 sort of stress what I think I said at the start of this rather long, long response was, we're not investing enough in civic infrastructure. We kind of imagine mm -hmm. that, you know, democracy is enough, just we have these big institutions, but actually it's about creating opportunities for people to engage across difference uh, for, for doing democracy. And I don't think we do democracy enough. And I think this is brilliant. I think what you're suggesting, which is, uh, I also sympathize with that view. I mean, obviously democracy really is not about, again, again as you say, certain processes or, or forms of govern, governance or even decision-making, but it's actually a, a set of ideas uh, or a belief system or a value system, you could even call it, uh, where everyone knows what we should be striving towards and we're all willing to work towards that, right? So I think if we all understand that it's, it's again, it's a, it's a set of values that we stand for and we need to understand that institutions don't make those values institutions need to be uh reconsidered in order to ensure that as times well, actually, are actually i think institutions i think there's a there's an iterative relationship i think institutions do structure people yes you know, so i'd say you know you so there is step, inter interdependency step, yeah. it, absolutely yeah, there, is. Absolutely. there is interdependence and i think this is what I'm, I'm trying to say that you can't just look at one yeah. and and, and then, you know, try to preserve democracy, because I think you're also doing work uh, on democracy in the long term. Yeah. You know, when you think about maintaining democracy, uh, I think you always need to consider these together. So the, the, the people, how people think about it, their, their values, their, their um, uh, you know, what they call, uh, hold, again, uh, not dear or sacred, I don't want to use those terms, but, you know, as something very important to everyone and, and to our society. So. Yeah. If you have everyone on the same page, I think then it's, you know, uh, with that understanding as a point of reference, then you can have yeah, those. I think, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, there is a, there, 
so just two things. One is kind of going back to going back. You started off with Plato. I might say Aristotle and say, actually, we might think of this as like a set of dispositions or something, mm. you know, a set of di dispositions which are democratic, you know, which are democratic in character. I worry slightly, and I don't, it's, it wasn't your intention, but mm. of, of saying that, that, that what, what, how you act democratically may differ depending mm -hmm. on where you find yourself within the society. So for example, I think that, you know, Black, li Black Lives Matter, yeah. the, 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 the activists there, they have a right to be on the street and to be kind of, um, and to be angry and to be kind of, you know, that, that is a democratic disposition because they are, yes. they are clearly identifying a limitation of our current democratic practices. So there is a danger with the sort of, particularly from the school of thought that I engage a lot with, with deliberative democracy, is it sounds like oh, all the time everybody should just be reasonable and kind of like yeah, walk across yeah. different. Well, sometimes there, there's a nice paper by Archon Fung where he talks about um, we, it's kind of del deliberative democracy before the uh, before the revolution. I, mm -hmm. you know, there is this kind of deliberative idea we're aiming for. But where we are is nothing like that. So actually, we don't can't expect everybody to behave deliberatively all the time when they find themselves in positions of structural injustice or something like that. Does that, yes. make, does that make sense? It makes it makes perfect sense, and I have a, a historical example on that. But I think you, you're absolutely right to point that that you know it's you need to understand again. And I want to make that point earlier that there is an inherent limitation in democracy because. Again, due to, uh, I, I like the term demagoguery. I don't think it's, you know, it's something that, something equivalent in modern times, but I think, you know, once politics become so partisan uh, and so polarized, uh, at some point when the public sees that nothing moves forward, they have to take action. They're not doing their job. And I think this is where you need direct action. Uh, I don't support violence, you know, and I don't think anyone does, but to be able to, uh, you know, to, to hold the government accountable when, institutions are not working when you're not engaged in that decision making when you feel that your decision making is not affecting the outcome which it should be because it is a, it is about uh, either a government representing you or you acting act, actively dating those decisions uh, and, and i'm thinking of the eastern roman uh, politia which was called politia and the empire is a, is a modern construct that is applied to that uh, to the to that era uh, uh, but it was actually a politia it was uh, almost a republic but not in the modern sense of a republic uh, and a lot of emperors, I mean, essentially, as Antony Caldelis, there's a brilliant book uh, that Antony, Antony Caldelis has, has written about this, uh, very thorough analysis, historically based, he has looked at all the Greek instant, instant Greek sources. Um, and he shows that actually emperors uh, were based on, their status was dependent on the authority of the public. And if the public felt that they were not doing what they're supposed to do, which was about the public good, uh, then they would rise against them, and and a lot of uh, many times because again, it, emperors could 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 preserve their power if the public would uh, c continue to acclaim them as emperors. The moment they, the public stopped doing that, they lost that legitimacy, and a lot of them were overturned because the public rose against them and killed. You know, many were killed and so forth in riots afterwards. I'm not obviously advocating for that, but what I'm trying to say is that um, you, even when you have something similar to what you would call you know like something with republican values right that, that it is about the public uh green with how the government uh, is doing things uh you always have i think it's almost a natural evolution of things at some point politicians forget that their job or will not do it well so you have to have some sort of way to to remind them to bring things to where they should be if that makes sense yeah. um so yes i do i do agree with that and, and we should you know, we we shouldn't be surprised kind of where we are because no. because if you think about the history of um what we call democracy which is actually the history of representative government you know, elections were introduced as a it, it, elections were not introduced, you know, with with um, full voting rights for everybody. You know, it was very limited. It was actually a way of the political class continuing its dominance over over other over over um, the masses. And so, you know, uh, going back to Aristotle, he says elections are actually elections lead to oligarchy. You know, it, it, it's it's a characteristic of oligarchy. So yeah. we shouldn't be surprised that however many years on, 200 years on after the sort of birth of representative government, yeah. we have very strong oligarchic tendencies because yeah. that's what elections give you. Um, and, it, and it always surprises me that democracy and elections are always equated with each other. 
I mean, I think elections have a role to play in democracies, but it, but elections aren't democracies. You know, uh, it's, 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 absolutely, uh, absolutely. No, you're right, and and I think this simplification is uh, is pervasive. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know. I'm not in politics, uh, but but I've seen it even in the media. Uh, no, I mean, if you look at all of the things, you know, every so often we have these things like the Freedom House. Uh, you know, yeah. The nation of you know, how free is this country? How, how dem democratic is this country? The Economist and various others do this. You know, yeah. one of the defining characteristics is free and fair elections. Yeah. Free and fair elections are absolutely critical in, 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 um, in democratic societies, but they are not the, they are, for me, they are, can't be the defining feature. Yes. Because yeah. actually, uh, and there are, there are strong arguments to make that actually we rely too heavily on elections, mm -hmm. which is why I get interested in things like citizens' assemblies where they're using, um, basically lot and rotation, you know, yeah. which, is, which actually was the original democratic method. I mean, you're right. Let's not, let's not push to one side all of the slaves and all the women who weren't involved. But, <laughs> but you know, but, but actually when the Athenians were thinking, how do we establish our, a, a more equal um, political regime, they yeah. didn't go for elections. It, yeah. It's interesting, absolutely. Um, and I think with elections, even when we look in, more, in current times, this is the thing. I mean, if you look at the exit of the referendum, uh, very many people were against, very many people were in favor. I mean, it was very close to what I understand in terms of the proportions of the votes. And, and I think that perhaps, as you say, if, the, if actually the point shouldn't be about identifying what the preferences of the people are. The point should be about having the conversation with the people or the publics or everyone and trying to get to a decision together because, because you can't know the answer without having thought about it and, and I, this is I mean anything in, in life anything we do we have to have some sort of information we have to have given it a bit of thought even if it's five minutes or ten minutes you have to have done some thinking about it and and I think really uh, having the deliberation that you're saying even if it's not but you use a random sample and, and it sounds like sampling is really important here uh, and how sampling works. Uh, and it, only, for, it, only, for some, only for some institutions. I don't want to say <laughs> there, are, there are other processes that are much more focused on kind of, um, you know, lived experience on people who, yeah. who, you know, people who are you know, bringing in people who have, you know, who, who have that kind of everyday knowledge of, of, of yeah. a particular area. So, so I don't want to say it's either elections or random sampling. I'm not that, I'm not that sort of. Uh, right. Uh, Radical. <laughs> this, is, this, is an, this is an important point, actually. This is really, I mean, as an ethnographer, I'm, I do think that lived experience, uh, you know, speaks for itself. And, and you know, even, even when you, I, I'm, I'm assuming, or that might be a way when you have people uh, gathered in a room to deliberate something, right, whether it's a citizen's assembly or a more casual, informal community, uh, you know, um, uh, initiative, uh, you, you could have people, sort of ethnographic narratives, right, lived experience narratives for people to understand what it really means to uh, to be in that position or to be facing that problem from that perspective and positionality so I think you know with ethnographic uh, sort of people centered material is, is really important um, this actually brings I mean in in, in I, I do development research development oriented research and the reason I started is because uh, I couldn't see the people anywhere. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of scholarship is dependent is de is based on sociological theories, and I could see no testimonies from you know the local rural communities. So actually, uh, I work in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the first thing I did was to develop this Socratic dialogical approach to meeting with communities and discussing issues that they think are important uh, about their community. And it's kind of very similar to what you're saying about deliberating together, because the way I was doing this exercise was again not to impose any con concept or construct or, or agenda. But it was to understand how they think about certain issues and then to explore what other issues they might have that we haven't identified evidently um, and it was interesting because when we started these dialogical sessions uh, men women literate illiterate because i was using a lot of graphs uh people were quite uh polemical with each other actually if you think that there are politics in the local villages and you know oh, yeah. there's oh, yeah. various alliances and and you go into that situation and you know uh, it's hard to have a conversation, but once you go through the exercises and people really understand that you're not there to impose anything, you want to have a conversation, you get to a point where everyone is working together. And I've seen that. I, I have a, a short article about one of these situations that I, I, I experienced, which was a uh, in Senegal, in, in uh, Gué de Chantier, uh, an eco village. And, um, you know, and I think it's kind of the same logic that you're applying. Um, you know, if you can, if we, I, I, obviously people will all start from a certain position and they might be a bit, 
uh, polarized because we all tend to have become polarized in this society. But if we find a way to have that dialogue, that conversation, then we can actually uh, see, at least not agree, but at least understand the other side better and then you know, be more willing to explore that option, I guess. Yeah, and so, so an example would be, you know, the sort of big citizens assemblies or even small ones that are happening at the moment, like in the UK around climate change, the French have recently done one, the yeah. Irish the Irish did one. If you just put 100 randomly selected people in a room and just left them there, God knows, you know, who knows what's going to happen, you know, particular pe people are going to dominate, you know, it's going to be... So yeah. you construct a space within which people can have conversations across difference in the way you're talking about. I cut, just a couple of things that came into mind as you were talking and reflecting back on a couple of other things is we are the current UK government actually does more. Um, I'm going to use the term public engagement in its loosest sense, public engagement mm -hmm. than most. It, it relies heavily on polls and it relies he heavily on focus groups. But what it's kind of doing is kind of saying, what do you think of this? What do you mm -hmm. think of this? Mm -hmm. What do you think of this? It's not saying how can we work together to build a better, you know, a, a a, a better policy or a better uh, future etc so so um, there are ways and means of engaging you know, mm. the second thing I, I just wanted to pick you up on something about you said uh, and you, I'm sure you you didn't mean it but you know, <laughs> people weren't thinking around Brexit I think people were thinking mm. the problem was their thinking developed through conversations with people like themselves yeah, yeah and that is true for Remain and it's true for um, for Leave and it's true now yeah. And we still not, and that's what I, that's my problem with contempt. Well, not my only problem, but the main problem that's coming out of this conversation is that the thinking we do, the work we do together, mm. the way we come to judgments is we tend to do them with people like ourselves. And that's actually a real problem for democracy mm. um, that we don't talk across difference or we, or we, 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 we're, we're not creating the spaces for people to talk across difference in, this, in, in the way that we, in the way that we need to. So and, and th I'm thank, to reinforce that those two things. Yeah, and thanks for thanks for clarifying that. Yes, I think I did. I, I was pe speaking more theoretically, not yeah, specifically yeah. in the Brexit, because I, I wasn't really. I don't think I was there. Uh, I wasn't very involved. I can't remember what was going on. I think, think you notice it if you were there. <laughs> I've, yes, well, because I, I'm always between Ethiopia for fieldwork and back to the UK, and I can't remember if I was actually yeah, right. in London at the time. Yeah. But but yes, I mean, I it felt like a very. Uh, emotional debate, you know, very, um, everyone was very strong in their, in their opinions and very strong in their positions. And, you know, that's justified, I understand. Uh, but as you say, the, the point is to bring different minded people in the same room to discuss it or to challenge people's uh, views yeah. from, a, from a slightly different perspective. Yeah. And, I, and this was actually one of my questions for you, it, you know, in the current climate where um, everyone is so polarized, and I think we can't deny that. It, you know, you, you look at the media, you invite people with different opinions, and there's, there's, there are many controversial issues nowadays. I think there's, there's no no controversial issue anymore. Everything is highly controversial. And you get these people in the media, and they're, they're debating, you know, one or the other side, and they end up, uh, you know, the, sort of hating on each other or being hostile. Uh, so it's really hard to, to, I mean, there are some conversations that happen well, and I think it's edu they're educational on both sides, but they're not the norm you know i think they do happen but they're not the norm um, and so i guess i wonder if we were to do a participatory deliberation now looking forward to how to the the, the, the lockdown right and, and how to proceed uh, and considering all the stakeholders how can we breach those very polarized sides if that makes sense or yeah, people who so might feel strongly about it so you're, you're you're right about um i think you're right about the sort of sense in which politics has become or, the, or what we're seeing is, in, is intense polarization. Mm. Um, but I want to go back to think about, uh, you know, kind of reinforcing things I've said already is that yeah. um, I don't think, I, th I think the problem is our media is polarized, our, poly our you know, kind of the, 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 the space, digital spaces are polarized, the, um, the you know, kind of, uh, and political parties play, play mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, everyone is polarized. I think for a lot of people, they're confused and they not really sure what's going on. And they're seeing these kind of shouts. I have a sort of, I think there are some, there are some people who really trade on polarization and they're doing very well for themselves at the moment. Um, and, you know, they're in, um, and in, in a sense, therein lies a problem that we are, we are sort of, 
within our democracy, we we have too many spaces which are which which provide for that expression of polarization. And my sense from doing work around Brexit and and from looking at work, I don't know, for example, you know, there was a citizens' assembly held in Ireland about the constitutional status of abortion mm -hmm. and about the constitutional status of single of of same-sex marriage. Yeah. And these were things that are incredibly polarized. But my friend who was involved in that, he said, well, what, what you do, what we did is we created a space for everyday people to talk about these things, which, and the, the, the extremes could come in and make their voices heard in terms of giving evidence, mm -hmm. et cetera. Then they had to go away. And actually the debate amongst the people who aren't, the, so, the, the mm -hmm. problem at the moment, we get this sense that everyone is polar. I don't, I don't actually mm -hmm. buy that. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think, you know, I think there is this a capacity and this innate desire. I don't think, you know, I think my, my sense is whenever, whenever people come into spaces where there is the opportunity to deliberate, they come out, not always, 99% of the time, people come out reinvigorated. I mean, I've got friends who work in the States who work with an organization called Everyday Democracy who have community conversations in communities where there has been racial violence mm. and they bring people together across, you know, difference mm. in that kind of, and they have constructive conversation. You can do it. It is just, we don't see that. We don't, I don't mean invest in an economic sense. We don't invest enough. Mm in creating that space we have created we are we you know we are we are victims of the fact that we have created these spaces which really allow extremes mm -hmm. to, to 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 thrive and we don't create spaces where we try and allow people to talk across difference and so i i guess i'm not I, you know it's an empirical question i guess i guess i'm not entire i don't buy the everything is polarized mm -hmm. What I buy is that we have a political system that thrives on polarization, and that's a slightly different thing. And thank you for making that distinction, uh, Graham. I, I've been listening with great interest, and I'm nodding all this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's a very wise um, uh, um, observation. And yes, I was pr primarily referring to the public picture, you know, the, the, the portrayal in the media of polarization. You're right, and 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 I think. You're absolutely right because I had these conversations with uh, um, people who work in university, uh, people who uh, professionals, people not necessarily academic, and and we all seem to um, have our own thoughts about it. Obviously, some are more critical of certain things, some less critical. But it's not, you know, it's not like we can't have a conversation. We mm. can have a conversation. We're different. We think differently, but we're still friends. You know, we're still colleagues. We can have our conversation. And I think this. You're absolutely right. I think this is a brilliant point that you're making that. Uh, we need to give more attention to those conversations on the back, uh, the, what is it, uh, behind the scenes, if that makes sense, because you're right. And, and, and again, this raises the other question that we, we hope to do another session specifically on that, on the role of the media on, or uh, social media and journalism, uh, not, not, not to, to generalize, obviously, because there's good journalism, there's, you know, nuanced journalism and so forth. But um, I think, again, as you say, there has been quite a bit and I don't like the term misinformation either. I think it's it's a um, it's a very sort of uh, positioned or situated uh, view that certain you know writers uh, write from. So I think it's always a situated knowledge. Knowledge is always situated. Opinions is always situated. And I think that situatedness is not being transparent. It's not being made transparent. You know, when you write an article, you should say where you're coming from and why you think as you do. Don't don't take it as normative because a lot of I've, I've seen a lot of articles written. Sources, BBC, The Guardian, from the positionality of the author. That's fine. It's fine for you to have that opinion, but don't assume that it's a general opinion and don't impose it as a normative, which happens all the time. Yeah. And I have a personal issue with that because, especially in gender studies and feminist studies, when something becomes normative, it becomes exclusionary. It becomes, you know, there's this question of justice. Uh, no one opinion should dominate unless, you know, again, unless we all agree. And I, should be the a point of, dom of dominance if that makes sense you know we should we should have a conversation everyone should understand that there are different perspectives and why i think people think differently and then try to work with that difference somehow to cater to all needs uh you know it shouldn't be about dominance and winning the debate or if yeah. that makes sense no no it, it does it does and i think there's a there is a issue here about our psychological dispositions which are you know we want to hear things that reinforce the, our existing prejudices 
and our problem is that our media environment, our political environment, our cultural environment at the moment sort of feeds, you know, feeds prejudices in those ways. But that's not a necessary, you know, that is, a, you know, we've got to recognise that that is a psychological disposition. There's a sort of bias towards things that confirm what we already hold to be true. Yeah. So actually doing democracy is quite difficult. Doing democracy properly, doing democracy well, is quite di is difficult because we actually have to say, I am going to go into this space where I am going to allow my prejudices to be challenged. Mm. Uh, and actually we've cre we're creating a, an environment within which we reinforce, you know, we te the tendency is to reinforce prejudice rather than, and I don't mean prejudice as in, you, you know what I mean, a sort of yes, yes. Our, our preconceived views of the world. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think that's where democracy does its work by mm. creating places within which we can challenge our own and others' prejudices in a way that is respectful, in a way that is, yeah. um, that is meaningful, and in a way that we can actually take this collective project forward. Because democracy, if de democracy is nothing but a collective project, a project for us mm. to try and work out how we're going to live together. Um, yeah. and, it, so it, and it isn't, we don't really achieve that well by just shouting at each other. Yes, you're right. That's a, that's a nice, I think that's a nice thought to sort of uh, slowly conclude with this discussion. Uh, I mean, one other question I had, uh, not to detract, but I think, you know, obviously there's, there's, very, there's been various governments and we do another webinar series uh, on how governments in the global south have, have responded. Uh, you know, not all would identify as democratic regimes necessarily, or would be described as democratic in the full sense of the, of the term. Um, but they have done well, you know, they have been uh, science driven considering multiple perspectives you know doing quite well in comparison to the uk i mean i was reading on the senegal's very scientific you know driven approach um there's very that have responded very well ethiopia has responded quite well uh although now you know the situation has changed slightly with with the number of deaths rising but you know you can tell that uh, there has been diversity in how governments have responded and i wonder what can all go different governments in the world right take away from this discussion you know <laughs> Regardless, I don't know if this is a, if this is a, 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 a not very intelligent question to ask. No, 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 I'm just thinking about all the governments of the world watching our conversation. You know, they could have... <laughs> <laughs> that's more insane. <laughs> but, but I wonder, you know, because a lot of people might think, oh, you know, it, this applies only to democracies. Your involvement with the public applies only. But I think, you know, whatever the regime you are, uh, again. The, say it's it's not just uh, certain aspects of or, or you know certain processes elections or that or this it, it's your larger approach of how you engage with your citizenry you know how what could they take away you know what, what could could is that i guess the engagement with the public is that limited to democratic regimes and democracies okay. so, so you give, you're asking me to, to, to uh, abandon my <laughs> my my position of life and give advice to autocracies is that what you're saying <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's, I don't know if it's autocracy is, is the right term. No, I know, I know, I was just. I yes, was... <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right. I'm challenging you because, again, I think people, you see, we are, we are trying to be decolonial in the sense of not speaking, speaking only from behalf of our context and our. Oh, of course, conditions. I understand. Uh, so, but you so, know, so, so countries it, that wouldn't identify, they might have democratic elements, but yeah, they yeah. wouldn't identify with that concept because it's Western or it's considered Western or whatever. So, for, so first of all, actually, there's one thing I wanted to say earlier, which I've completely, completely passed, passed me by, <laughs> just, just, as, just as a sort of coda, is, is to say that this isn't all about what governments do, um, is because actually sometimes it's a government's not doing something and giving power to people to make decisions rather than rather than the kind of formal structures of government. So um, sometimes, you know, yeah. part of this is also powers being moved away from, from traditional governments. But anyway, mm -hmm. and I think that's also true within, we see that within less, within semi-democracies or non-democracies as well, that actually, you know, I've, I've done some work, a little bit of work, not much, you know, about community-based natural resource management, where you see mm -hmm. local communities taking control of their resources in order that they can sustain yeah. them. Yeah. rather than them being exploited by people from outside. The, co the commons. Yeah, that, that, right. that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think if we are thinking about this from a, from a government perspective and we're not thinking about, uh, and as we've said, you know, there are ways mm -hmm. of thinking of our existing Western democracies as not always practicing democracy as, 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 as we would want to think about it. Um, 
that there is i'm just trying to think i'm i'm what i'm just worried i might make a mistake with my use of language but I'll, I'll get it back. but it's about a sort of you know almost like I, i'm thinking back to sort of feminist arguments about an ethic of care towards mm -hmm. towards a population and care towards a population isn't just sort of saying that oh yes i'll take your interests into account but actually um having mechanisms and processes by which people's lived experiences are actually understood by those who are making decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, personally, I would like to see those people, those lived experience, you know, I want to go fully democratic and say those, those lived experience will have an effect on the, on the political decision. But I think there's, there's something here about um, decision-making that is informed by that diversity. And the tendency within democracies and non-democracies is for the political class, the ruling class, to respond to the interests which keep it in power. That mm -hmm. is a kind of dynamic, whether, whether we're talking about an elected regime or a non-elected regime. And, de and democracy really asks of political leaders to go beyond that sort of partisanship and think, and, you know, try to make policy mm -hmm. uh, that actually responds to the diversity of, of experiences, the diversity of, yeah. uh, of perspectives. And I think that's where we, we sort of missing a, a trick and part of this, and we didn't have enough time to talk about this. Part of this is about the structures of, of government, you know, short electoral mm -hmm. cycles. Yeah. I mean, that we're already yeah. thinking about how am I going to win the next election? The power of particular vested interests means that they have to be appeased. And yeah. we've got plenty of evidence that governments and democratic governments, and non-democratic governments tend to respond, tend to make policy for particular groups within society, particularly yeah. those who are wealthy. And so, so I'm, I, you know, the kinds of things I'm talking about and I, are about developing mechanisms and ways of working that take these different lived experiences seriously and take mm -hmm. seriously the idea that public policy and public decisions should be based on understanding and responding to that diversity. I think yeah. that's where democracy, that's for me what democratic government should be about. Yeah. And there's going to be, co you know, Governments have to make decisions. There is coercion going to happen, but it must, it's the, the process of the formation of the public will here or whatever is, is, is really critical. And I think we mm -hmm. don't put enough e emphasis on that. I think this is brilliant to end, well, to, to conclude. Uh, and, and, I, and just to give the, to pass the last word to you, Graham. Uh, <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you. It was absolutely uh, insightful conversation, very educational on my end, listening to you. Uh, I wonder just to give uh, to to give the audience to, something to think about as we as we lift uh, the lockdown. How I mean, what would you tell uh, the politicians here in the UK or us? You know, us in who are part of these publics. How can we be more involved? I mean, is there something we can do now in this in this particular process of lifting the ban and and thinking about the consequences and making sure that these consequences, uh, the different perspectives about the consequences, are fed to the government. Uh, a small, small question. Small so, question uh, to end with. <laughs> so I'm involved in this project, which you mentioned at the start, with the um, the participation charity involved in the UK, uh, called a Democratic Response to COVID-19. And we kind of recognise that, you know, or we're looking to show or and think about how participation could be participation and deliberation could be enhanced, both in the short term, in terms of thinking about the immediate transition out of lockdown, social distancing, those sorts of things, in terms of the medium term. In thinking about things like, you know, what should a recovery look like? What what sort of stimulus should we be thinking about? And in terms of long term, in terms of holding decision makers to account for the decisions that they made during this period. And in all of those three areas, we think that public participation and deliberation is absolutely critical. So, you know, if I had my chance, my my chance to make an elevator pitch, or hopefully the elevator would break down and I have more time, um, that that I would be. <laughs> arguing that that is fundamental to rebuilding democracy um, and re-energizing re democracy um, post uh, pandemic or as we, as we move out of that pandemic. In terms of what ordinary people can do, that's, you know, that's really tough here because mm -hmm. personally, I think a lot of the opportunities are really around uh, you know, I'm very passionate around climate change, so I get involved with Extinction Rebellion, but Black, Black Lives Black Lives Matter, yeah. or other, you know, other 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 movements like that, I think are really important to democracy at the moment to make visible those areas where governments are failing to act. Um, 
in terms of the kind of participatory politics I'm talking about, it, it is really trying to push for local authorities, for national authorities to try and be more open in the work that they do. It's really actually quite hard to build a social movement around democratic change. Usually we, we build social movements around particular ends, particular, you know, particular mm -hmm. policies. But actually, I think it's really critical. So if, if people are out there, you know, let's build a social movement around wanting to, looking for more participatory and deliberative democracy. I mean, that, that, that would be my greatest desire would be that people recognize the problem is pe I think people recognize that democracy isn't working well, but they don't have that sort of like platform to read. Yeah, we, we, yeah exactly. We, we have it. And you know, it's partly a failing of people like myself. Don't speak. You know, don't, oh. you know, we, we, we haven't made that case strong enough. And I think that case for doing to democracy differently, doing politics differently, is absolutely critical at, at, at this time, COVID-19 point, but it's also critical in relation to dealing with climate change, to dealing with racial injustice. All of these things require us to do democracy better. Absolutely, and until the next crisis. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a pessimist, but that's the, 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 the cycle of, of history, I guess. No, you I mean, can make, yes. So, so you know, uh, you, you, there was that famous quote, and I can't remember who it's by, and it's probably by somebody I don't want to be associated with about making, <laughs> the, best out, making the best out of a crisis. The problem is, that people like you and I um, don't strategize, you know, the people who are really making the best out of the crisis are the people who make a lot of money. You know, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they yeah. know what they do. We, 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 uh, we haven't got that. We don't seem to have that acumen in terms of making social change. But, you know, you're quite right. There are moments in time when you can have that opportunity to do democracy differently. And I think COVID offers that, offers that opportunity. Yeah. I think that the climate crisis does. I think the crisis around racial injustice and um, you know, uh, uh, opens up that kind of space yeah. and you know part of the discussion then has to be how can we how can we do politics how can we do democracy differently well i look forward ground to seeing what uh, your pro project uh, how it evolves because it's a very interesting one and i think you're going to do online discussions so we're going to watch out for it and you know if you set up something I'm, i'll be the first participant, <laughs> uh, participant. If, if you do set up you know an, an initiative to really uh, think of how do we re-educate ourselves around thinking about democracy and its limitations. I'm really happy to support it. I think we do want to see a more activist uh, scholar, you know, type of scholar, you know, more active, um, active role of scholarship in these debates, because if we, as people who study various phenomena so closely, don't participate in these conversations, then, should, you know, what is the point then of studying these for so long? Uh, that, yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah, so, so think, Graham, if you're a scholar on democracy, it's a bit bizarre you're not interested in engaging democratically. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Graham, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for the time. To you too, it was too early in the morning, but you did. It was a marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> it was a marvelous discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, watch out for our coming coming uh, conversations. Hopefully, we'll do one on media, and you know, we look forward to seeing what happens with your work. Okay, thank all you. the best. Stay safe. Good luck Bye, with your project. Take care. Th thank you. All the best.